Hi everyone. I hope that you had a great weekend. Um, so today I'm going to talk about antigen presentation. Just so you are aware, I usually do this as two lectures and tried to smush them together into one um, so that we had more time for some cool stuff at the end of the semester. Um, so we'll see how this works. Um, and um, also remember that you have a uh, set of inquisitive questions due on Wednesday by 5 p.m. Um, so uh, please remember those. Um, I also have your exams graded um, to give back to you at the end today. Um, so one thing that I will um, mention um, just straight off on this slide is that uh, when an immunologist hears the phrase antigen presentation, that means something pretty specific. Um, and so sometimes students start to use antigen presentation throughout the semester for, to mean other things. Um, so specifically when I say antigen presentation, I mean an MHC molecule presenting a peptide to a T cell. Um, so sometimes people want to think of like ways antigen gets moved around the body and they'll be like the antigen gets presented to, to blah 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 and I'm like no antigen presentation <laughs> specifically means you are putting a peptide on an MHC molecule. So it's specific so when I see antigen presentation I know that we are talking about something related to MHC function. So far remember that the reason why we're talking about MHC and MHC function is because MHC plus peptide is the antigen for the T cell receptor. So we're really thinking here about the antigens for T cells. And we've talked about the structure of the MHC protein. We've talked about some of the genetics of the genes encoding those MHC proteins. And what we're going to be thinking about today is how we go from a protein from a pathogen inside of a cell to break that down and to eventually get into an MHC uh, molecule. In talking about that, I need to give you a brief review of a little bit of cell biology, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page of some pieces of cell biology that we'll be applying. So this is a view of the biosynthetic secretory pathway, um, sometimes also known as the secretory pathway or the endocytic pathway, which includes the ER, the Golgi, and then these secretory vessels, vesicles that are bringing things to the outside of the cell, as well as endocytic vessels, that are, vesicles that are bringing things into the cell, um, potentially to the lysosome. This image is color coded. The cytoplasm is light blue. The nucleus, which is its own thing that we're not going to even care about right now, is dark blue. And all of the parts of the biosynthetic secretory pathway are in uh, yellow. And so you can see all of these compartments that are connected to one another in yellow. You'll also notice that the area outside of the cell is yellow. And so immunologists often kind of Think about the cell as being divided into the sort of light blue area versus the yellow area. The light blue area is the cytoplasm. Anything that's in yellow is across a membrane from, a cytopl from the cytoplasm. So if you want to put something or move something into a yellow location from the cytoplasm, you have to cross a membrane. Uh, and that is sort of a key piece here. And you can also see that all of these compartments are interconnected. Um, all of the yellow compartments are interconnected with one another. In normal cell biology, we often see proteins potentially made in the cytoplasm and then shuffled around to different parts of the cell. Um, we aren't going to care about anything that's here. So we only care about cytoplasm or in the transport pathways. We're not going to care about nucleus, mitochondria, peroxisomes, or plastids today. Um, and to go 
cytoplasm into this transport pathway, uh, a protein that needs to cross a membrane. That requires energy. And the way that the cell gets the energy for doing that is that it actually brings the ribosome to the ER and uses the physical force of the protein coming off the ribosome to push the protein across the ER. So basically, it's sort of like getting a two for one on its ATPs. It's using both the ATP to make the protein and to shove the protein <laughs> through the ER. Um, and that, but the point that I want you to see is we had to use some ATP, we had to get some energy to move the protein into this transport pathway. And once our proteins are in this transport pathway, we're probably not gonna like have them leave the transport pathway and come back in and leave and come back in because that would require energy and ATPs every time. So basically the proteins are either in or out. <laughs> or they're in the blue area or they're in the yellow area. Um, and that largely is decided kind of when the protein is synthesized. Um, it can also, or if the protein came in through endocytosis or phagocytosis, then it's coming in through these uh, vessel, vesicles as well. One other thing that I will mention more specifically on the next slide, but it's sort of implied here as well, is that this also is true of transmembrane proteins. So if a protein is going to be a transmembrane protein in any membrane of the cell, it has to be put into the membrane. And it's, that is also done co-translationally, as is shown here. It takes some energy to actually get the protein stuck in the membrane as well. When we look at proteins moving around in these vesicular compartments, there is a certain arrangement that we often see, or the topology that we often see with that movement. So here you can see this little compartment. It could be the ER or the Golgi or an endocytic compartment or whichever your favorite compartment is. But what you'll notice is that it's got a lipid bilayer. So it's got a blue layer of lipids and a green layer of lipids. Those are like the inner and the outer leaflets. The blue one is touching the cytoplasm. The green one is not touching the cytoplasm. You can see we've got these little proteins embedded as transmembrane proteins and the circly part is next to the cytoplasm and the pokey part is away from the cytoplasm. And we can see that we've got some cargo, some proteins inside the compartment. If we're going to move materials from one compartment to the other, the topology always stays the same, which means that the green membrane lipids always stay inside, away from the cytoplasm. So you can see we kind of pinch off this little vesicle the green stuff is still inside. And then our new vesicle fuses with the target compartment and the green ones also stayed inside. So the stuff that was away from the cytoplasm is always away from the cytoplasm. The blue, the lipids that were next to the cytoplasm, always next to the cytoplasm. Our proteins that are embedded in the tra as transmembrane proteins, the side that was next to the cytoplasm, the circly side, always stays next to the cytoplasm. The pokey side that's away, always stays away. The cargo always stays inside the compartment. It doesn't come outside. Um, so it kind of matters how we put things into the membrane in the first place, or how we put things into this pathway in the first place because their arrangement is going to be maintained as they travel throughout this pathway. And you can see the same thing on the right. It's just a different image showing basically the same process. This is um, also particularly important um, when we are thinking about um, things that are plasma membrane proteins or secreted proteins. 
So if a protein is going to be a plasma membrane protein, you can see that it can have part of its protein outside the cell, facing outside, maybe as the receptor to bind to whatever it's going to bind to. Or, I don't know, to be an MHC molecule showing off a peptide <laughs> to a T cell. And that side has to be on the outside. If it was pointing in towards the cytoplasm, that would kind of be pointless and not really be useful. Well, that's a w you can see the circles away from the cytoplasm. So the circle had to be away from the cytoplasm in my vesicle in order to get this kind of arrangement set up. And it had to be inside the cytoplasm like this. And so it actually mattered how we put this protein in the membrane, which direction we put it in. We can't put it in upside down. If we've got something that's cargo in this uh, pathway, we can see that that cargo, if we fuse that vesicle with the uh, plasma membrane, will become secreted. Um, so if we've got something that's in here and we fuse with the plasma membrane, the stuff is secreted out. Um, as you will note here, this is referred to as the constitutive sec uh, secretory pathway. Constitutive is a word in biology that basically means automatic or by default or you don't really have to tell it anything else to happen. That's what's going to happen if you don't give any instructions. <laughs> um, and in fact, this is the constitutive secretory pathway. Um, also, you can see what I'm showing you here is exocytosis, where we have some cargo inside a vesicle that gets secreted by fusing with the membrane. Um, you can also see that endocytosis or phagocytosis, as we'll discuss a little bit later, is pretty much the exact opposite, where we have stuff outside of the cell and it gets brought into a compartment um, and is sort of internal to that compartment. Um, and just to sort of, so you recall, um, when we are seeing our proteins go into this pathway, they are generally either coming from the cell exterior because of phagocytosis or endocytosis, or they're coming in at the ER. The place where we're shoving them in with the ribosome at translation, that's the ER. So the ER is kind of where this all starts and is a pretty important place in this whole situation. So we are going to see some of these cellular locations throughout this process today. So I, we needed to make sure we're all on the same page about where they are as we go forward. Um, so we're going to first talk about MHC class one and how MHC class one gets its peptides. So again, notice here, MHC class one has this transmembrane domain. It's got its peptide binding cleft with a peptide in it. And it needs to have that facing outside the cell to show to a T cell. It would be really bad if it was facing inside the cell and was being shown to its own cytoplasm. That would be pointless. Um, we want it to really look like this. Um, and class one, um, MHC class one process that we're going to talk about is being done by all nucleated cells. When we think about MHC class one and the MHC class one peptide antigens, um, these peptides are coming from the cytoplasm. And so you can see um, this example from your textbook. The little flower is the, um, the antigen from the microbe. Um, as a person who suffers from a lot of allergies, I'm like, yeah, get those flowers. Um, and, so, and you'll see that it's in the cytoplasm. It's, in the, it's not in the vesicular component part of the cell. And so that is sort of the key part of MHC class one uh, presentation. When I first started teaching about um, MHC presentation, uh, I kind of learned this or was taught this as a process that has six steps. So I'm going to tell you about each of the six steps. Some of the steps you're going to hear me talk about and be like, that is the dumbest thing ever that it gets a step. The reason why it gets a step is because we're going to compare and contrast with class two. <laughs> so as you look at some of the steps and are like, really? It's a step? Yeah, because compare and contrast. Um, so the steps are um, the acquisition of antigen. So how did we get the protein in the first place? 
how did we tag or label the protein to be destroyed? How do we do proteolysis? How do we do delivery? Binding and display. So these are the six steps that we're going to see um, for both class one and class two. For class one, acquisition is pretty easy slash lame. This is one where you're like, really? Let's get the step. Um, for acquisition for MHC class one, it's simply having something in your cytoplasm. In a lot of ways, it's being infected with the microbe. The cell doesn't really have to do anything. The cell doesn't have to try to acquire the antigen. It doesn't have to try to be infected. It just is. So just infection, having stuff in the cytoplasm. And this is class one, and I'm not going to write it at the top because I can't reach that high. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to tag that um, protein to be destroyed. We need to say, to sort of set up a situation where that protein is going to be destroyed. And we do have um, a way to do that. As you will see today, in uh, the cell, there are two different ways things can get destroyed. One of them is if it's in the cytoplasm. The other is if it's in the vesicular transport pathway. It's almost like cell biology is, whole, is set up on this whole cytoplasm versus vesicular transport pathway thing. And so this is really sort of the general way we, we get rid of things that are in the cytoplasm. We have this small protein called ubiquitin. Um, you can see uh, ubiquitin is sort of list shown here as like a red shape, um, just written as ubiquitin <laughs> up there. Um, it is a small protein, um, 8.5 uh, kilodalton, 76 amino acid protein. And it can be added to stuff. So it can get stuck on things. Um, there are enzymes that will actually put ubiquitin onto things. So here we have protein with no ubiquitin. Now we've added ubiquitin because of this ubiquitinating enzyme. You can see sometimes we get a bunch of ubiquitins added on as a chain. Um, there are some specific types of biochemical linkages that are really important for the ubiquitin addition here. Um, in fact, if ubiquitin gets added with different kinds of, biological, of, of biochemical linkages, it actually is different signals to the cell. But this is kind of the basic one that we're going to talk about. And so basically what we do um, to tag a protein for destruction is we um, ubiquitinate it. So ubiquitination, you may also sometimes hear the word ubiquitilation, and they mean the same thing. And so the idea here is just that, you know, you're putting a sticker on the protein saying degrade this protein. Sometimes proteins get stickers on them, like normal cell proteins get ubiquitins on them because they're misfolded or they have some kind of problem and the cell needs to get rid of them. Sometimes cells get ubiquitins added to them just at a general background rate. We just replace a lot of our proteins every so often, even if there's not necessarily anything wrong with them, um, just because it's a little bit easier to replace them sometimes than to check and see if there's anything wrong with them. It's kind of like your iPhone. Sometimes you just got to get a new iPhone, even if there wasn't really anything wrong with the other iPhone. <laughs> and so sometimes we're just we're going to add ubiquitins at some rate to proteins. If a protein has a ubiquitin added to it, then that protein is going to be taken to an organelle in the cell called the proteasome. 
we know that the proteasome is an organelle because it has ohm at the end of its name. But if you look at the beginning of its name, we can learn what this organelle does. So what do you think the proteasome does? What, does pr what is the beginning of proteasome? Yeah, protease. This is the protease organelle. This is the organelle that breaks down proteins. So if we have a protein that has, gets ubiquitins added to it, it can be taken to the proteasome, and that will get that protein degraded into peptides. And so the way that we do proteolysis for class one is with the proteasome. And again, this is just generally how we degrade cytoplasmic uh, proteins in the cell. Um, you can see some ex uh, examples of the proteasome um, here. So the proteasome has a cap on either end, and then it has these four ring-like structures that are each made up of seven different individual proteins. And those rings kind of make this nice little chamber, almost like a little barrel, um, where we have lots of active protease sites. You don't want to have random protease just floating around the cell, because then that would degrade the cell. So you, ha you keep the proteolytic activity of this organelle inside this barrel. Um, again, you can see the alpha and the beta subunit. So we've got multiple little proteins making rings here, um, which I will mention in a second. Um, and so what will happen is that the caps on the end will recognize the ubiquitin, will actually take off the ubiquitin so it can be recycled. And then we'll th the peptide will get threaded through the proteasome and cut up into peptides. So you can see this process from two different versions of two different textbooks here. Um, so this is how we are going to do proteolysis um, normally in the cell for cytoplasmic proteins. But it's also going to um, be, very, be the way that we make the proteins for MHC class 1. Like I said, this is sort of what's happening generally in the cell all the time. When we are making an immune response, particularly if cells have been exposed to interferon, they get even better at doing this. Beca they start to do this proteasome activity even better to make some peptides for class one even better. The way that that works is that when interferons are present, the cell starts to make some different subunits for the proteasome, some different beta subunits that are shown here. And in, in fact, becomes what's known as the immunoproteasome. And the immunoproteasome, one thing that it does is it makes almost all its peptides be eight to 10 amino acids in length. So they're like the perfect size for MHC class one. Um, and they also will have um, some other properties that make them particularly useful for class one. Um, so it's not like the regular proteasome doesn't make anything that's good for class one. It's just that we sort of get a bias um, with the amino proteasome. Um, so this is one way that the innate immune response is sort of impacting the adaptive immune response. Once we start making a good innate response, um, we switch the proteasome to being an amino proteasome. And if you were to look for the genes of these amino proteasome subunits, they are encoded in the MHC region. Because um, I remember at one point I told you, oh, look, and here's some genes of immunologic importance. <laughs> well, some of them are those proteasome subunits. So acquisition, tagging, proteolysis, pretty straightforward for a class one. With both class one and class two, there is a problem. There is like one step that's the all-star problem step. And in some ways, it's delivery, really, for both of them. But slightly different ways of delivery. So at this point, we thought about the peptide, where the peptide is. We're breaking up the peptide to make it into short pieces, right? But we haven't seen the MHC class 1 molecule yet. The MHC class 1 molecule has not yet shown up. So where's the MHC class 1 molecule during all of this? The answer is that the MHC class 1 molecule 
as a transmembrane protein and specifically as a transmembrane protein that will eventually be on the plasma membrane has to be biosynthesized in the ER. So you can see MHC class one um, here having been biosynthesized in the ER. It will eventually have to pair with its partner beta 2M. And MHC class one doesn't actually completely uh, get to its final folded form until it has both beta 2M and the peptide in the peptide binding cleft. Um, that means that before we've put the peptide in the peptide binding cleft, MHC class one is not able to be in its completely perfect folded form. And so there have to be a whole lot of chaperone proteins around holding MHC class one sort of in its approximate form. So we've got MHC class one hanging out in the ER, being held by all these chaperones. And here's our proteasome in the cytoplasm, degrading proteins into peptide fragments. So the big problem here is the delivery problem with MHC class one. I had to modify this figure from your textbook to, to make it actually um, not give you the answer yet. Um, but what's the problem? If you look at this image, we got an issue. What's the issue? Yeah, Michael. Yeah, the peptide fragments are in the cytoplasm, and the empty spot waiting for them is inside the ER, across a membrane. So we've made all these great peptides, but they're in the wrong spot. They can't get on the MHC class one cleft, and we want to put the MHC on the surface of the cell, so the cleft really does need to be in there. So we got a, we got a terrible problem, big impasse. This is the issue for MHC class one. Eventually, it was discovered that there is a specific transporter in the ER that uses ATP to take peptides from the cytoplasm and basically shoot them into the ER. So we have this special ATP dependent transporter known as TAP. Uh, that will put, that will deliver peptides. That's what I'm going to say. TAP delivers peptides to MHC. So that we can get those peptides into the location where they need to be. Once TAP has delivered those peptides, um, binding is pretty straightforward. And that binding is also pretty straightforward because of the chaperone proteins. Remember I mentioned all of these chaperone proteins that are holding on to the MHC class one molecule? They also, and particularly one called tapicin is really good for this. Tapicin actually holds the MHC molecule right next to TAP. So you have this MHC molecule with an open cleft directly next to the place where the peptides are getting shot in. Um, so we have it basically tapicin making sure that um, the peptides and the MHC are in the same place. They're right next to each other. So the MHC is ready to catch those peptides when those peptides are uh, brought into the ER. And then as long as the anchor residues match, the peptide just binds onto the MHC molecule. So tapicin helps keep everything in proximity in order to allow binding to happen. And if the anchor residues are good, binding's good. Yep, Jameer. Uh, 
Um, there are probably, a f yeah, there are probably a few. Um, and then as is both implied here as well as on a later slide, once MHC has its peptide um, in the peptide binding groove, once MHC class one has peptide in the peptide binding groove, um, the chaperones go away and it, the MHC molecule just gets taken to the surface. This is in fact a constitutive process or an automatic process. Once we have this finished MHC molecule, we just put it straight up onto the surface. Um, and so it is a constitutive display. And you can see this here. Um, so basically, as soon as we get our uh, peptides onto the MHC, we just move that MHC right up to the surface of the cell um, to present. And this is my sort of general overview of the class one presentation pathway that I just told you about. Um, so we are now kind of at one of the points where I chopped out a bunch of stuff. Um, so I'm going to try to tell you some, something sh in a short form that I often talk about in a very long form. So let's hope this works. Um, so I really like this review but it ha and these images from this review. And like some of them are really wrong. So I had to like edit them a lot. But I really like the idea. So here you can kind of see the overview of the MHC class 1 presentation process. We've got a protein. That protein has multiple parts, multiple epitopes. You know, like the wing versus the leg versus all the other parts. The proteasome is going to cut up that protein into those different parts. Tapicin, or tap and tapicin are going to move that part to the MHC molecule so that the MHC molecule can present that epitope on the surface of the cell. Um, also realize that there's so many parts of this that are that like I like this image and yet they draw some parts of it so wrong. Um, also realize that on every nucleated cell, you've got two HLAAs, two HLABs, and two HLACs. So each of them may be presenting a slightly different part of the original protein, depending on the peptide binding cleft or the anchor residues. Um, that we're going to see. And so we're not necessarily going to see one of the peptides getting presented. We might see a bunch of them getting presented depending on the different uh, MHC molecules that are there. When I talked about these six steps of MHC presentation, leading to this whole process. Which of the steps that I told you about were special for proteins that came from microbes versus which ones are just general cell biology things that happen to all the proteins in the cell? Yep, come here. So Tagging happens to all the proteins. Yeah. Proteolysis happens to all the proteins. In fact, all of these steps can happen to all the proteins. With MHC class 1, cellular proteins are in the cytoplasm. Cellular proteins can get ubiquitinated at some level, get, prote get through the proteasome at some level. The cell doesn't know, like, this amino acid stretch, it's a bad one. It's just a peptide. And so the peptides are all just going to get shot into the ER. They're all going to end up on MHC, and they're all going to end up at the surface of the cell. Here you can see a cell with multiple MHC molecules on its surface. And what you'll notice is that 
there are some self-peptides getting presented going through this process, as well as non-self-peptides, peptides from the virus. So all of our nucleated cells are presenting self-peptides all the time. The ability to know, should I recognize and do something about it, or should I ignore this, is on the part of the T cell. The T cell is the one who knows this is a good peptide or a bad peptide. MHC, is, we are presenting self-peptides 24-7 on the surface of all nucleated cells. So I wanted to remind you that this is on, happening on all of every cell except for what, red blood cells, all your nucleated cells all the time. This is in fact a bit of a quality control method as well for the cell. This is basically the cell being like, hey, I'm okay. Here are my, are my proteins. Can we check them to make sure I'm good? There are a whole bunch of cases where there can be problems with cells that make the cell stop making MHC class one. And we have this whole arm of the immune system that we get to later in the semester, where if you are missing class one, you die, or you get killed. So cells that do not have class one, that means there's something wrong, and they get killed. The cell should be presenting and showing off its self-peptides, being like, T cells, am I good? T cells, am I okay? T cells, is this, is this fine? When there are foreign peptides, like peptides from a virus, they're usually made at pretty high concentrations. So they're going to be on the surface of the cell at pretty high concentration. Um, and they're also going to be foreign to the T cell. Um, but know that in the case of MHC class one, all day long, all the time, you are presenting peptides on your uh, nucleated cells. So now we are going to contrast the class one process with the class two process. Class one is basically used for presenting peptides that were in the cytoplasm, in the light blue. MHC class two is going to be used to present peptides that are in the biosynthetic secretory pathway um, or in the compartments or the yellow parts of this cell. Um, you can see that here as well, that the peptide is maybe something that came in via endocytosis or phagocytosis and is in these, one of these compartments already. Um, we are eventually going to put that peptide, of course, on MHC class 2 um, to show to CD4 T cells. One thing that I told you about last time is that uh, MHC class two with a peptide in its cleft is an incredibly stable molecule. It's SDS stable. That stability is going to come up. Um, and also note that this MHC class two process that we're going to see is really only done by three types of cells in your body, B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells, the professional antigen presenting cells. Um, so we can see MHC class two uh, going through the same six steps in order to do presentation. If you remember with class one, um, ac acquiring antigen or the acquisition of antigen was pretty passive. The cell didn't have to do anything to get infected. The cell didn't have to do anything to have the protein in its cytoplasm, it was just there. This is different than MHC class two. In MHC class two, the cell actively has to do something in order to acquire the antigen. The most famous way that the cell is going to acquire the antigen is by phagocytosis. And so what we might see with phagocytosis is that we're going to have, you know, some receptor on the cell bringing in the microbe and putting that microbe in the phagosome, one of these membrane-bound compartments, as we've seen. 
And eventually, I want to switch the order of these. Okay. And eventually, when we bring in that material into the phagosome, that phagocytose material will eventually end up in the lysosome for degradation. So I'll just tell you that tagging is sort of like being in the phagosome. <laughs> so there really isn't a specific thing we have to do to tag here, whereas in class one, there was a thing we had to do to tag the protein. Um, but there's one other piece to realize here. So when I told you about the cells that do MHC class two presentation, I said that there were three types of cells that do class two presentation. B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. Way back, like day two of class, I told you that there were only three kinds of cells in your body that can do phagocytosis. Those three cells are macrophages, dendritic cells, and neutrophils. So phagocytosis can't be the only way you get antigen for class two. Because what about B cells? B cells don't do phagocytosis, but they do class two presentation. Um, so this sort of gets me to tell you a little bit about, again, some general parts of, or general types of um, internalization in terms of cell biology. So here you can see different little compartments that the cell can make to bring stuff in. You can see some of them are pretty tiny. And the, ones that's made, the one that is made during phagocytosis is gigantic compared to the other ones. Um, it actually involves the cell having to move the cytoskeleton and do a lot of work. Um, phagocytosis is a very, very specialized process. But there are other ways that cells can bring things in. Um, you learned uh, in Bio250, for example, about clathrin-coated vesicles. Those types of things can come in via endocytosis. So endocytosis is much smaller uh, vesicles. Um, this is usually involving clathrin. Instead of calling the compartment we make the phagosome, we call it the endosome because it came from endocytosis. And it eventually ends up in the lysosome too. Um, this is sort of showing a very simplistic version of early endosome, late endosome, lysosome. But there are the more people study this, the more they come up with like in all sorts of intermediate weird compartments that interconnect in all sorts of ways. So um, you can realize that. Often the way that endocytosis happens is through a receptor. So the cell might have a receptor on its surface. When something binds to that receptor, the cell might be like, okay, I'm gonna take you in now. Um, that process is known as receptor-mediated endocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis. And it could be being in the phagosome or in the endosome. And so here you can see um, that receptor-mediated endocytosis process with the B cell. So our B cell can bind to antigen using its B cell receptor. You know about the B cell receptor. And when that happens, that can trigger the cell to internalize both the receptor and the antigen into an endosome. The B cell receptor will get recycled back up to the surface while the antigen that has been brought in will be broken down by the B cell. And so B cells can do MHC class two presentation or acquire their antigen by receptor mediated endocytosis while macrophages and dendritic cells are going to acquire their antigen by phagocytosis. Either way, we're going to then end up with 
our material in sort of late endosome, lysosome meat compartments, um, whether we came in via receptor-mediated endocytosis or by phagocytosis. Um, so uh, the good news is that we're already in the secretory pathway. <laughs> we don't really have to do much work to get into the secretory pathway because we actually brought stuff in through this pathway. And all of these vesicles are connected, like the early endosome, late endosome, lysosome. Um, they are related to one another. Uh, and so we can basically just move our materials through this pathway that already exists and is kind of just the way stuff gets moved in this pathway normally in the cell. One piece of that is that as we go through this process, as we go through um, from one compartment to another, those compartments, compartments get progressively more acidic. Um, and that um, acidification um, turns on some proteases that allows us to have, um, to do some proteolysis. So we have our acidic compartments that are full of nucleases, proteases, glycosidases, lipases, all the aces so that we can degrade things. And this is, partic this is really the d definition of the lysosome. I think of the lysosome as the trash can for the biosynthetic secretory pathway. So proteolysis just happens because you're in the lysosome. The acid um, environment, as well as all of these different enzymes proteolize anything that we have internalized in this, process, in this pathway. So again, seems easy. So this is one figure from your textbook that is great because it makes exactly the oversimplification that I would want to make here. If you look at this, it makes you think that class two, so easy. Because we, we bring in the microbe, we bring in the antigen, into one of these compartments where it, by definition, automatically gets degraded. And that happens to be the same place where MHC is, which is already in this pathway. And so we just bind and we all live happily ever after. Not quite so easy. Not quite so happily ever after. So this is my other um, image from your textbook that I had to modify. And I I'm so annoyed that they, do, they draw it this way because it would be such an easy fix to draw it correctly. Because this is really the problem for MHC class 2 presentation. MHC class 2 is going to be is a transmembrane protein. It's going to be on the surface of the cell presenting its peptide to the, um, the T cell. As a transmembrane protein, it gets biosynthesized in the ER. which is the same place that class one got biosynthesized and was the same place that class one got its peptides. In fact, we have this whole tap mechanism shooting peptides into the ER. Your textbook shows this as two separate halves of the cell, but there's not a line in between, really. I tried to make there not be a line, but there still is a line. I tried to get rid of the line. There's no line, there's no wall. If we're a macrophage, a dendritic cell, or a B cell, well, all those cells have nuclei. So they're doing class one and class two at the same time. They're, they have MHC class one and class two in their ERs. The problem isn't getting the peptide to the MHC. The problem is this shows the MHC just staying there perfectly empty until it gets to the peptide, right? So here it is, it's empty, 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 empty. Oh, wait, wait, I found my peptide. Yet we have it in a place where we're shooting a bunch of peptides. 
The problem here is not delivering the peptides to the MHC. The problem here is how do you deliver an MHC to the peptides and not have that MHC take one of the class one peptides? The way that this really is happening, it could take a class one peptide. So we have to worry about delivering the MHC, I guess delivering bindable MHC to peptides. So it's a slightly different delivery problem here. So if you look at this image, that's almost perfect. How might you imagine a way that you could deliver that MHC to the peptide and make this whole business work? Don't overthink it. Pretend you're like six. Yeah. You could block it. You could put a cover on it. <laughs> exactly. You could, you could just block that MHC. And so when we biosynthesize MHC class 2, we biosynthesize it with another protein that serves to block the cleft. And so you can see this protein here blocking the cleft. This protein is known as the invariant chain. So when MHC class 2 is in the um, ER, it has the invariant chain blocking the cleft. Uh, invariant chain is actually a pretty cool molecule because it has this part that blocks the cleft, but it also has this transmembrane domain that acts as a delivery signal. So it basically also is like the FedEx label that makes the MHC get here. So we both block the cleft and we have a FedEx label to put the MHC in this exact location, um, all with invariant chain. Um, and invariant chain does typically uh, hold three MHCs together with three invariant chains, as you see here. So invariant chain is going to be here in the MHC class one uh, cleft, blocking that cleft as the molecule is moving. So they don't have it drawn here. And as the molecule is moving through these different compartments, these compartments are getting progressively more acidic. And that invariant chain is getting degraded. It's getting digested bit by bit. Till at the end, we only have one little piece left. And that's the piece blocking the cleft, um, which on the previous slide was shown as either the, the red or the purple, like the color. This part is this part that is left at the end, um, which is known as CLIP or the class two invariant peptide. So basically, we end up with our MHC class one, or our MHC class two in the location ready to bind to peptides with CLIP and um, we've got our peptides sort of coming into the right location. Um, so we're going to use invariant chain which contains CLIP for delivering the MHC to the peptide. Now we get the most fun step of the whole thing. We're going to now get to a position where we have MHC class two with clip that ends up in the same place as peptide. I want you, I, on this, I'm gonna go to the next slide it has four little images. I want you to ignore the one on the right because we're going to talk about what is going to happen. So pretend this is not here. <laughs> so here we are. We have our MHC class 2. It is biosynthesized with invariant chain. 
which helps it travel to the right location. Over time, we degrade invariant chains, so we just have clip. And now finally, we get MHC class 2 with clip in the same location as the peptides. And now we've got a problem. What's the problem now? Yeah, Demir. Clip is blocking the binding still. And remember that I told you that when you have class 2 with a peptide in its cleft, it's a really stable molecule. So you have this really stable molecule here. Somehow you have to get clip away so you can put in one of those peptides. The way that this works is with a partner protein. This partner protein in the uh, human system is known as HLA-DM. In the mouse system, it's known as H2M. So those are really interchangeable names for the same protein. Do the same thing. It's just whether we're talking about the human name or the mouse name. I don't have, I'm trying to think of a good way to, to do this as a funny demo. I can't. Um, So imagine that that is MHC class 2 with clip in it. And I am HLA-DM. The way that this actually works is HLA-DM does this. It actually makes a physical interaction and forces. It like body checks <laughs> um, the MHC class 2 molecule to try to knock off clip. Um, clip knocks off pretty easily. And then other peptides can bind. HLA-DM will keep interacting um, until we get a peptide in there that cannot be knocked off. Um, so we have a good interaction. So HLA-DM actually uh, physically interacts with the MHC molecule to knock off the clip protein. So HLA-DM um, in humans or H2M in mice um, allows uh, binding to happen by making this physical interaction. Yes? So how does DM know when it doesn't fall off? Um, so because when, the, when it falls off, the MHC is open, and it will have different binding characteristics when it's open. Um, one thing that immunologists have spent a fair amount of time trying to address is where exactly this process happens. Um, and they try, well, we know that class one gets its peptides in the ER. That part's easy. Um, people have done a lot of experiments to try to figure out, is it the early phagosome, or the endosome, or the phagosome, or the lysosome, or blah, 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 blah. And none of the experiments agree. And so in the end, we gave up. And we call the place where this happens the class two loading compartment. Just made up its own place, because the data don't really line up perfectly to any place that we know of. And we're still discovering new types of compartments. So for now, it's just the MHC class two loading compartment. Yes? The DM oh. is interacting, and we're loading. The, we're loading the class two in the loading compartment. Um, then, in the case of class one, display was constitutive um, or automatic. Um, that is not really the case in MHC class two. So, in MHC class two, the cell actually gets triggered to put. MHC class 2 on its surface. Um, so what we can actually see is that the MHC class 2 might be hanging out in this compartment. Um, here you can see a dendritic cell um, that interacts with a T cell. The green is the MHC class 2. And if you look, once that T cell triggers the dendritic cell, the dendritic cell extends out this microtubule and shows off the class 2. So this isn't a constitutive automatic process. This, uh, and then it actually retracts. Um, here you can see 
um, unstimulated dendritic cells, that dendritic cells that have not seen LPS, and those that have. And you can see that they've put all of their CLUS2 on the surface. Um, and so this is actually a microtubule dependent process um, where the cell is going to signal, uh, get triggered and then use microtubules. to put the class two on the surface. Um, somebody I knew in graduate school, Marianne Bose, um, did this beautiful work showing all of this. Um, and if you read her paper, she made up a name for this process, which was tubulation. And I'm sorry, Marianne, tubulation is not a word even 20 years later. Just, nope, can't. <laughs> um, so here is our general summary of the MHC class one and MHC class two process. So you can see the difference in how the antigen is acquired. Um, in class one, we've got sort of this passive, the antigen's this there. In class two, we had to actually actively acquire that antigen. Um, you can see that we uh, proteolized in the phagosome in class two, in the proteasome in class one. We had this delivery issue with class one that used TAP. We had a delivery issue in class two that uses invariant chain and DM. Um, and then we've got um, either display through this microtubule dependent process or through this constitutive process. Um, so I'm pretty excited that this is kind of working for me. Um, I have one additional piece about antigen presentation, um, but I'm actually gonna save that for Whatever the next time I see you is, not that I ever know what day of the week it is. Maybe today's Monday, so then Wednesday. Um, before we go into some aspects of T-cells, um, so that I can uh, get, spend the rest of the time handing out the exam.